Um, I want to talk to you about how I came to faith because I think it's important uh, to tell our stories of how we came to faith. Now, if you have one of those stories where you say, oh, I was, I was always a believer, I accepted the Lord when I was five, and that whole thing, that's not a bad story. Don't be ashamed that you didn't have a season of, you know, crack use or something. I know it's much, much more exciting if you could say, yes, I was down to my last rock of crack, and I was just saying, Lord, I don't know what I did. You know, that's a nice story, but don't go looking for those stories. It would be far better, folks, uh, if you don't have those stories. Uh, so I have somewhat of a story like that, and I want to I tell that story. Um, but I think it's important for us to tell our stories of how we came to faith, because it's invigorating to see the greatest miracle the Lord does, we, you hear this over and over, but it's true, is to change a life. And again, some of us, we get saved, our lives don't change that much, whatever, but there are many stories where people's lives change dramatically. And you can't make that up. It's the work of the Holy Spirit and why the Lord does it in some lives and not others, whatever. Hey, we, we don't have all the answers. And if, if, you, if you want to crab at God, like, what about this, what about this, what about this, you know, he'll be like, what about everything. What about life? What about the, the blessings I've given you? So we always have questions. Uh, but I just want to say up front that we've, it's important for us to tell our stories of coming to faith so people realize it's not something you're born into. Because you, you can't be born into the faith. Even if it seems that way, it's still not that way. Uh, the Holy Spirit comes in and he wasn't in. But at some point he comes in. And that's a holy moment. And sometimes you can point to that moment. Sometimes you can't. Don't get hung up on that junk, folks. Just focus on the basics. God is alive, and he is life. And he wants to come into us who are dead. Think about that. You're not sick and in need of a touch. You're dead. And only if you're dead can the resurrection life of the Lord do anything for you. Because... The resurrection life of the Lord doesn't need to come into someone who's already alive or thinks they're alive. You need to know you're dead, to be dead, in, to, be dead to self so that the life of the Lord can come in. But my story now, the, uh, I wrote a book. It came out a couple of months ago called Fish Out of Water. Uh, how do you pronounce water here? Water? Water? water however you pronounce it. Um, fish, fish Out of Water. And uh, the reason I call it Fish Out of Water uh, is actually complicated. Uh, I'll tell you that as I tell you the story. But the bottom line is that the story of Fish Out of Water is the story of my life until around my 25th birthday and when the Lord dramatically came into my life. And in my case, it was, it was dramatic um, and totally miraculous. And again, that doesn't happen to everybody, but it happened to me, and it's true, so I'm going to tell you the story. But it really happened, so this was 1988. I had just moved away from Boston. I was here for a couple of years out of, out of college, and I moved back in with my parents, and the Lord spoke to me in a dream, and it was one of those life-changing, earth-shaking moments that it's like I went to sleep single and I woke up married, changed. <laughs> if that happens in real life, you could probably get out of it legally, but I'm just telling you, in my case... There was no way out. It happened. So, but in order for that dream to make sense to you, I got to tell you the story up to that point. So that's why in the book, Fish Out of Water, I kind of tell the story of my life so that by the ending of it, when I get to the Jesus dream, you're like, oh, I get it. Because otherwise it would be a non sequitur because uh, he didn't live my life. So I, I want to tell you that story. And uh, now the title, Fish Out of Water, really stems from the fact that at the end of the story, Jesus is the fish out of water. Uh, he reveals himself in this dream, which will make sense to you in a few minutes. But through my life, I always felt like a fish out of water. And that's kind of the story. And I think it applies to all of us that if you're honest, you know you don't belong here. You're a fish out of water. You, you don't fit in. If you fit in, hang on, because eventually you won't fit in. None of us really fits in here, right? We always want to, you know, go to a bar where everybody knows our name and uh, really fit in, but that's a sitcom. And it doesn't really, it, 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 it doesn't work that way. We are strangers here. We're passing through. That's the human condition. 
And some people can admit it. Some people can see it. Some people can't. Um, but I felt in my life I was always trying to fit in and never quite fitting in. So my, the, the reason for that uh, is that my, I, the, the book starts, oh, I should say this up front. I wrote the book, F Fish Out of Water. I've written many books. But that book, I specifically wrote for believers to give to non-believers. To give them a book that's not a Jesus book. It's just a book. It's just a book. Don't be scared. It's just a book. It's just a memoir with a lot of insanely funny stories. I promise you, they all happened, and there's no exaggeration. You say, this can't be right. Yes, every word is true in these stories, and I'll tell you a couple. But I wrote it because I, I want to reach the people who wouldn't read that Christian book. Do you know anybody like that? I hope you do. You should. People that you give them that Christian book, they're like, thank you, but eh, it's not for me. Of course, it is for them. They just don't know it. They don't realize that that's for them, that the Lord wants to reach them just as he wanted to reach you and each of us, but they don't know it. So sometimes we have to be a little sly in the way that we approach them. And I thought if I write a book that's just a memoir, there's, it's, it's not a Jesus Christian book until you get to the end, and then wham, I hit you with both barrels and you're out. And, uh, but that's kind of like when you tell a joke, right? You, you, don't, you don't reveal the punchline you, you want to bless the person at the end by hiding the punchline, right? Isn't that, isn't that kind of the way it is? Or if you're boxing, you don't want to telegraph your punch. That's different, though. That kind of redounds to your benefit. But the point is, you don't want to give it away. And so in the book, I, I tell my story without really referencing, you know, the God stuff until I get to the end. And then you realize it all weaves together. Who wove it together? The Lord wove it together, as you'll see. So here's the story. My mo mother and father uh, came from Europe in the 50s. My dad came from Greece. My mom came from Germany. They met in an English class in New York City. Uh, English, not like Milton and Chaucer, like learning how to speak English, right? Anybody here not speak English? Okay, because I, I don't know what you're hearing, if that's the case. But um, my parents came here uh, escaping countries that were not doing very well. Now, if you're here in this country and you take this country for granted, you know, you should spend a couple of years in North Korea and maybe you'll get appreciation of what, what we have here or in China or in most countries besides this country. This country is uniquely blessed. I spoke about this last night and I write about it in other books, but I want to tell you that my parents didn't need to be told that America was a blessing, land of opportunity. Uh, they, they knew. My mother grew up in Germany during Hitler. Uh, her father was killed in the war. I dedicate my Bonhoeffer book to him. After the war, the Soviets took over that part of East Germany, and it became East Germany. And my mother was under communism. And she escaped at age 17 because the Soviet propaganda was so onerous and horrifying that she couldn't bear it. She had to get out. Gesundheit. So she knew the evil of communism. My father came from Greece. Both of them went through the war, horrors of war. No food, lost their fathers at an early age. Uh, after the war in Greece, the communists tried to take over. They had a civil war. So my father also knew the wickedness of communism, socialism, Marxism. And the idea of freedom on the American model is just an unbelievable gift from God that most people in the world only dream of being able to live with this kind of freedom, which most of us take for granted and don't do much to preserve which is the reason we're losing it. And I spoke about that last night. And by the way, if you weren't here last night, shame on you. Just, just kidding, just kidding. You can get the tape, you can get the video. Um, so uh, actually, uh, let me say one action point because I always forget at the end of my talks or whatever. Uh, do me a favor, go to my website. It's just my name, ericmetaxas.com. Sign up for my newsletter because a lot of the videos and things that I do and a lot of the interviews that I do on my radio TV program, they've been wiped off of YouTube. And so we will send them to you once or twice a week. And I've interviewed some amazing people. That's another story. But uh, I just want you to have the benefit of some of those conversations, which are great. So just ericmetax.com, and you can sign up for the newsletter. And there's, you know, there's no charge. If you do before midnight tonight, you get a free uh, carton of smokes. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not unbiblical, right? We get smoke. Spurgeon smoked, didn't he? Uh, so... Anyway, so my parents come to America, and they meet in an English class. And, uh, you know, if you're raised by a Greek and a German, most people know that means you will be raised 
Greek. Do you understand? Greeks, like, they're not going to apologize. They're the best nationality, and they're just, you know, they're just going to live that out. So I was raised in the Greek Orthodox Church growing up. But the Greek Orthodox Church, for many people, any kind of ethnic Christianity tends to be less Christianity and more like an ethnic group, right? So it was a wonderful, warm community. I'm not going to pretend that it was some uh, unpleasant situation. But they kind of assume that, hey, we're not Turks, we're Greeks. The Turks are Muslims, we're Greeks, we're Christians. Done. Uh, well, if you're in America, it's not that simple anymore, right? Once you leave that church, most people out there, who knows what they believe, especially in a secular environment like the Massachusetts or Connecticut or New York. So, but they didn't really give us uh, the basics of the gospel. And so you grow up in church, but you don't get the download. Some of you have uh, grown up in Catholic churches where it's the same thing. There's nothing wrong with the denomination. It's just that in certain churches, they just don't, they just kind of assume like we're here, so it's good. But you need to get fed. You need to get taught what people beyond that building don't believe and do believe and how to, do you really believe those things? So in the Greek Orthodox Church at Easter, there's some beautiful things where they say, Christos Anesti, Christ is risen. It's this thunderous thing. But, you know, by the time I got to college, I thought, do I believe that? That's kind of like, you know, uh, happy St. Patrick's Day. You know, like, it does it really, do I believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Do I know? Can we know? I, I, I didn't know. And so by the time I got to college, I wasn't so sure about these things. But before I get to that, I just want to talk to you about how I was a fish out of water. So you can imagine, if your mother's German, your father's Greek, and you're hanging out with all the Greeks in the Greek church, you're not going to feel that Greek. You're not going to feel Greek enough. And the Greeks want you to be totally Greek because that's, they know what a blessing that is. So, so hanging out with the Greeks, all the Greek kids, I went to Greek parochial school, all the Greek kids speak Greek at home. Of course, it's the best language. Why wouldn't you speak Greek at home? So they speak Greek at home, and they eat Greek food and whatever. And I, I never felt quite Greek enough because my mother's German, and she's packing me, like, liverwurst sandwiches. And I just don't really feel like I fit in and stuff. And so I'd hang around with the Greeks, and, you know. So it, it, it's, it's a blessing having parents from the other side for many reasons. Number one, because they did teach me to love America. They didn't need to talk about it. They just would talk about where they were from. And where they were from, where there was suffering, and there was lack of opportunity, and lack of freedom, and lack of the security of knowing where's the country going tomorrow. You know, it's, it's an amazing thing that we take for granted in the, in the United States. But growing up with a Greek father in particular, uh, there, there are many funny things to me that, that, that happen, where my father just doesn't get the stuff that the Americans' kids would get, right? So the American kids would play, like, you know, catch with their father, father take them to the ball games or whatever it was. We, we didn't have that. We were just, like, my parents, they were thinking, like, listen, nobody's shooting at us. There's food on the table, so shut up and do your homework, right? So basically, uh, there were a lot of moments where I just felt, you know, you're embarrassed by your immigrant parents because they don't, they're not cool like the other parents. Not that the other parents are actually cool, but that's your perception. So I remember one time when I was like five years old, we went to a uh, Flushing Meadow Park. No, actually, sorry. It was uh, College Point Park in Queens, New York, because we lived in Queens with all the other Greeks. And uh, we're at the park, and my uh, brother and I were kicking a soccer ball around with my father. We're like five and four, and we're sweating. It's the middle of the summer. Where are you going to go, right? And so we jump in the 1960 Valiant and would drive to this park by the East River. And, you know, because my father didn't understand baseball or football or whatever, we're doing the soccer ball thing. So eventually we're exhausted. We collapse on the blanket and we hear the ice cream truck coming. And my brother and I lose our minds because we speak ice cream truck. We understand. Good, right? So we jump up and we're like, Dad, Dad, Dad. And we're trying to pull him up. You know, you know kids who are like, they're about 40 pounds and their arms are like really thin. They're trying to pull an adult up off the blanket. To, it's not going to happen. But my father, he says to us, no, 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 no. It's not necessary. I have V8 in the back of the car. Right? So that's like when you realize, wait a minute. What's going on? We watch enough TV. We know this is not normal. We're supposed to get ice cream right now. It costs 15 cents. And, and so, so my father, after the ice cream truck leaves, he takes us to the, to the Valiant, opens the trunk, which is like a pizza oven, pulls out warm, gaggy vegetable juice in a can. And it was almost hot at that point. 
and he offers it to us, and he's drinking it like, yeah, it's great, it's great, great. And I think to this day, he still does, he's 94 now, but to this day, he still doesn't quite understand what the problem was, because he took care of what we were looking for. Like, you're going to be hot? I got V8. Like, what's the problem? But that's like, you know, th that's basic. So my brother and I were obviously deeply scarred by this. It messed us up. And so uh, I remember when I was like 11 or 12, my father took us to McDonald's, and... Um, you know, we're in line at McDonald's. We've been there a million times. My mother would take us. My father would never go to fast food. You know, they don't have that, you know, during the war. There's no fast food. So he walks in there, and he, he, he looks up at the board, and he says to the, the, the pimple-faced 16-year-old behind the register, he says, um, give me one uh, whooper. <laughs> and so my brother and I, like, we just collapse in horror because we're like, Dad, it's pronounced whopper, not whooper. And by the way, Whoppers are across the street at Burger King. This is McDonald's. We want to die. Help us to die now because we'll never be able to face anyone again. But the beauty of it, my father's confusion was always that unless you understood my father, you wouldn't even know what he said. Like, I'm sure that the, that the 16 year old behind the register had no idea what was going on. Because if you're, if you're there to take an order in a McDonald's and somebody says, Give me one whooper, you, you don't even know that they meant to say whopper. You don't know anything. You're just like, Excuse me. And then I say, Dad, 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 Dad. So, you know, and the, another incident was uh, when I was maybe 17 or 18 filling out, uh, <laughs> filling out financial aid forms for college. And that to me, like, I'm a humanities guy, that was like hell. To sit there at the kitchen table after dinner to fill out humanity, to, to fill out financial aid forms for college and stuff. My father's sitting there; it's tense. I don't want to do this. And uh, at some point, I was like so put out by this experience that the way seventeen or eighteen year olds can be, you know, to their parents, I said, "I don't want to talk about it." Now, who even talks like that? That's like something I heard in a sitcom. I don't want to talk about it. You know, like I, I was kind of. And my father, to my shock, responds with a similar cultural phrase that he must have heard someplace. And nobody would have known what he meant by what he said, except for me, his son, who spoke the magical language of my, my parents, right? My father meant to say something I think he heard in the carpool on the way to work one day. He barely knew what it meant, but I think he thought he'll try it out. So I go, I don't want to talk about it. And my father, in um, taking umbrage at this statement, he says, he wants to say, what do you think I am, a leper? That was, like, that was like a big phrase in the 80s. What am I, chopped liver? What am I, a leper, right? right? But my father has no idea what a leper is. or what. I don't know what, what he was saying, but he thought he'd try this out on his son. So in this moment of tension where I say, I don't want to talk about it, my father shouts, who do you think I am, a leprechaun? <laughs> now, you can understand, no one but I would even know what he was trying to say. I knew what he was trying to say, and when he said, who do you think I'm a leprechaun, I realized, like, my father has no idea what a leprechaun is, all right? He doesn't hang out with the Irish, no offense, you know, to the mix in the audience, okay? He, he, he doesn't know what a leprechaun is. Today, today, he still doesn't know what a leprechaun is. So he just explodes at me in anger. Who do you think I'm, a leprechaun? And I was, like, I just blurted out. I said to myself, you know what? No one in the world will understand this story, so I'm going to have to explain this story. But growing up that way, you get a, a weird perspective. Because most fathers know what a leprechaun is, and they know what a whopper is, and that you can't get a McDonald's, and they know the kids don't want to drink V8. So I always felt like a fish out of water. And even when I was hanging out with the German gang, my mother's friends, I felt like a fish out of water because guess what? I wasn't German enough, right? So they thought liverwurst sandwiches were normal, right? So I was always betwixt and between growing up. I got to say that... Uh, being Greek was, is very important to Greeks. It's kind of like their religion or their hobby. If you ask a Greek, what's your hobby? He will look at you like, what, what are you talking about? I'm Greek. Like after work, what do I do? Like I go in the basement, I do Greek stuff. I don't, I don't know what they do, but it's like their whole life is being Greek. It's an identity. Not a bad thing. But again, if your mother's German and you're trying to grow up in America, somehow that makes you feel slightly uncomfortable. Uh, another part of my life that was actually very important to me, and this is important for the dream, is fishing was a big thing to me. Again, I grew up in Danbury, Connecticut, Canwood Lake, biggest lake in Connecticut. Did a ton of fishing, was in a bass fishing tournament, did a lot of fly fishing. So that was my big hobby. And I remember one day, the two parts of my life collided when I was in the back of a, I'm sorry, I was in, in a car with my dad. 
And right in front of us, we stopped at the exit. He says, you see that fish on the back of a car? It's a gold, it's a, a, a chrome fish, right? He goes, do you know what that is? And I, I didn't know. I'd never seen one before. They had just uh, come into existence in the 70s. I said, no, what's that? He says, that, is, that fish is a Christian symbol. And as some of you won't know this, so this is interesting. It's a Christian symbol, and we would think, oh, it's a Christian symbol because we don't know, because we're fishes of men or something like that, right? Right. Well, my father tells me where it really came from, which is true. He says, the ancient Greek word for fish is ichthus. Ichthus, the letters that spell ichthus, are an acronym. The early Christians, who didn't use the sign of the cross quite yet, they would use the symbol of the fish because to them, ichthus was Isus Christos Theos Imon Sotir. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Savior. So the symbol of the fish to the early Christians was Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Savior. That's what that meant. They all knew what it meant. So my father was thrilled to communicate this to me, probably mostly because he wanted me to know Greek words. I think the Christian thing kind of figured into it, but he was very excited. So I always understood that, and I thought most people don't really know that, and certainly most young people like me had no idea that the fish symbol is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Savior, and it's a Greek word. So that was, a, that was an important thing uh, for me. But fishing was a, big, uh, was a big thing for me. But then I left Danbury, Connecticut, and I went to Yale University. Now, some of you may know Yale University is just ever so slightly secular. Did you know that? Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, to be perfectly honest, it was founded by ministers of the gospel, amazing men of God. They, they've only kind of gone off, you know, the ledge uh, theologically, like only for the last roughly 200 years, right? So, you know, you got to give them a break. Anybody can have a bad two centuries, you know, you, you, we're not, we're not going to hold it against them. But they are, by the time I got there, the naive kid raised in a working class immigrant household, I had no clue what I was stepping into, you understand? I just thought, hey, the motto is lux et veritas, light and truth, and I'm going to learn about truth and, and, and everything. I'm excited. I don't know that I'm walking into a culturally Marxist lion's den, but I was, and I'd not been prepared in the Greek church, as many people are not prepared in various churches. They just stumble into this environment that is utterly anti-Christian and anti-American, because all of that culturally elite thinking was already there when I got there in the 80s. So I stumble into this situation, not really seeing it for what it is, and then I begin to drift with the zeitgeist, just kind of figuring, well, this is what the elites think, so I guess they must be right. So Christianity must be some kind of parochial faith. It can't be right and true. It's maybe part of some larger truth. Um, and I was an English major, and so I wanted to kind of figure out the meaning of life, reading books and things, taking this stuff in. And um, that was an important part of things for me, too, that I was not just an English major to be an English major, but I was, I was trying to understand life. Uh, I was reading these great works of classic literature and realizing they all say something about the human condition. And it's kind of a fascinating thing, because through good art, you can learn things, right? You can learn about the human uh, condition. And even if they don't have an overtly Christian perspective, if they're pointing to truth, you know, here's a little secret, Jesus is truth. So they're leading you to, to understand the world in which you live. But most people uh, at Yale, they already got the memo that the meaning of life is there is no meaning, there is no God, and it's depressing, so we don't want to talk about it. So, you know, get to, do like an econ major, study really hard, get a good job in a bank or something like that, and it'll all be over in a few decades. But just don't think about the meaning of life or God or anything because it's depressing. So they don't advertise that at a place like Yale because it is too depressing and too bleak. And this is one of the tip-offs that Marxism makes no sense or that atheism makes no sense. And Marxism is, of course, atheism, okay? If you have anybody in the BLM community, you can let them know, oh, by the way, yeah, Marxism is anti-God, so you could say whatever you want, but you have no moral foundation. But, but the point is that the people in that world, they think it's a good thing. They haven't really thought it through. And they also know instinctively, because every Marxist atheist is made in the image of God, Psst, you're made in the image of God whether you like it or not, and he has created you to long for him. So they can't pretend 
that they're satisfied by the conclusions. The conclusions are infinitely bleak. I mean, if somebody tells you, hey, there's no God, if you're stupid, which many people are, you'd be like, great, I can do whatever I want. But then take about a step or two past that initial immature thought, and you think, oh, there's no God. I could do whatever I want. There's really no good or evil. I could do whatever I want. There's no good or evil. I could murder people, and that's not even evil or bad. It is meaningless. They could murder me. They have done no evil. It's neither good nor bad. It's meaningless. There is no God. To look at that concept all the way to the bottom is like staring right into hell. It is horrifying, and it's antithetical to everything that every human being is, not every Christian, every human being knows somehow, because you're created by the Lord, that you long for meaning and truth and beauty and goodness. And so if you think about it, which most people spend their lives avoiding thinking about it because they're scared of it, but if you think about it, it is, un- it is, is limitless bleakness. It is horrifying. So who wants to think about that? Actually, um, at places like Yale and in the cultural elite world, they've figured out that, oh, yeah, Darwin proves that, you know, we all got here by total accident. There's no God. And then Freud shows what he shows or whatever. So, yeah, we, we pretty much know that that's true. But we're not going to advertise it because it is too bleak and too horrifying. So we're going to kind of fudge it, right? We're going to try to you know, split the difference between the bang and the whimper, so to speak. We're just going to pretend that uh, we don't see where it goes, but neither are we going to avoid it. So we're going to give you this kind of idea that, you know, life's kind of a joke. There's no meaning and have a good time. Get a great job. Work really hard. Be successful, you know, but don't think about these big questions because you don't want to think about them because the answers are ugly, right? So have a good time. Laugh. Laugh. Uh, maybe be sarcastic or cynical because, you, you know, you got to deal with this painful reality that you know is there, but you don't want to deal with it straight on. And, but the key is to get a good job and to focus on that and to focus on success and having a good time. And, you know, on the weekends, there's alcohol and sports, and you focus on that. And in a few decades, it'll all be over. But just don't think about these big questions. Well, uh, that's what a lot of people do, isn't it? But the problem is, I did not get a good job. I was an English major. I wanted to be a writer. I graduated. I did not get a good job. I had a lot of time to think about these questions. That's bad. You don't want to think about these questions. So I floundered and I drifted. Uh, I floated up to Boston for some time trying to be a writer. Just lost. I was not some big sinner. I was just lost. Is there a God? I don't know. I'd like to know, but I don't think you can know. I had kind of taken in this worldview. And uh, if you graduate from college and you don't have a good job, you don't have a direction, uh, even if it's a bad direction, and you start floundering and floating and drifting, you know what's going to happen. I'm going to tell you exactly what's going to happen. It's inevitable. You will move back in with your parents. (laughs) There's no way around. That's like like a theorem. It, there's no way around that. That will happen. That will happen. So now you don't want to do that if your parents are working class European immigrants who didn't get to go to college and who work menial jobs so you could go to Yale. You really don't want to move back in with those people at that point. But I mean, it was a theorem. I had no choice. I moved back in with my parents. So I leave Boston. I go back to Danbury. And my parents are like, why are you here again? Like, didn't we like work hard jobs and work on the weekends so that you could go to Yale University. Like, it's a pretty good school, right? Because we paid more money than we have. So why are you here? Well, uh, it was no fun. Now, Now, my friend's parents, who were, you know, sophisticated people, they'd be like, oh, Eric's finding himself. You know, he wants to be right, he's finding himself. But my parents were like, Eric should find himself a job. We don't understand this. Like, we don't really get what's going on here. So it was a horrible year for me. Horrible. And sometimes the Lord will maneuver you into a horrible situation to bless you. I don't know if you've ever been maneuvered into a horrible situation where you look back and you go, like, thank the Lord for that miserable experience because that led me to Jesus. Well, 
at the time, it's no fun. But I was uh, living with my parents. I got a job as a proofreader at Union Carbide Corporation in Danbury, Connecticut. Some of you familiar with the Hebrew word Gehenna? <laughs> if you didn't get that joke, you're probably not saved, so you might want to... <laughs> but I want to tell you, it was hellish. I was the editor of the humor magazine at Yale. I wrote poetry. I wanted to be a literary writer like John Cheever, who lived up in Braintree, and uh, John Updike, who lived on the North Shore. <laughs> you know? I want to I follow in their footsteps. It wasn't really looking too good for me, right? I'm back living with my parents. What can you do with an English degree? It only costs $40 billion. What can you do with that degree? I can't do anything with that degree. I'm going to get a job as a proofreader at a chemical international conglomerate. <laughs> and so I drive to this job every day. My, my little cubicle is a quarter of a mile from the nearest window. Have you ever been in a building like that where you want to blow your brains out? In a good way. Uh, pure hell for me, but what else could I do? Uh, I'm proofreading, and of course I'm writing on the side. I'm going to be a big success, uh, you know, writing my short stories. But of course I'm not writing short stories on the side. After a tiring day proofreading chemical manuals, I go home to have the joy of my parents glowering at me. Why are you here living in our house? This is weird. So it was, it was hellish. It was hellish. But in the middle of that hell... God, in his mercy, sent a man into my life. He was a graphic designer at Union Carbide who knew Jesus. I dedicate my miracles book to him. His name's Ed Tuttle. He starts sharing his faith with me. Now, I was smart enough to know that people who really believe in the Bible and all that stuff, they're crazy. They're, they're kind of insurrectionists who want to overthrow the government with guns, and they need to be put in jail, preferably solitary, because they're that dangerous. Uh, they believe in truth and God and all that stuff. And we, we, the sophisticated people know they're trouble. And we're evolving beyond that kind of parochial medieval thinking. So I, I was in enough pain to want to talk to him a little bit. But I was also trained to avoid those people at the same time. So I had this kind of weird cat and mouse game. Over the months, he would share his faith with me. And I would pretend that I'm sort of on board because I wasn't really hostile entirely. I just just didn't know what to think. But he'd invite me to church. I'd be like, no, no, thanks. I don't want to go to that church. And uh, I don't want to hang out with no freaks like you guys. I'm sophisticated. How many freaks? Come on. So I just thought, no, I don't want to do that. So in the middle of this weird thing, I'm starting to be so miserable that every now and again, I like throw up one of those weird prayers like, God, if you're there, give me a sign. Because I didn't even know if the Lord was there. So imagine how tough it is for people who don't even know, like they say, you know what you have, I'm glad you're happy, but I just don't even think, I think you're, you're just making that up. I don't think there's a God, but I wish he'd reveal himself to me if he were really there. I was like that. Once in a while, I'd throw up a prayer, figuring, I don't know if he's going to hear it, but, and it was just a painful time. Now, I got to say the one thing before I had my dream is that while I was at Yale and after, I'm trying to come up with my own worldview, right? What's the meaning of life? If it's not that Christian thing, it's that maybe all religions are getting at the same thing. So as only an undergraduate can do, and this is not a compliment to undergraduates, I came up with like, you know, hey, here's the meaning of life. All religions are trying to get the same thing. And I read, uh, you know, a little Freud and a little Jung, and they come up with this idea of, oh, there's the, uh, the conscious mind, and then there's the unconscious mind. Uh, and Jung talks about the collective unconscious, which means the, the, the unconscious of all of humanity. And that's kind of God. That's the guy. Now, if this sounds like gobbledygook, that's because it, actually it is gobbledygook. It's stupid. But if you're 20 years old, you don't know that. Sounds good. So I thought, okay, so maybe they're onto something. Maybe all religions are about, you know, kind of drilling through the conscious mind to get to that spiritual collective unconscious, which is kind of like a new age energy force God, and that, that's what they're all trying to get at. That's what all religions are trying to get at. Now, it's not like there's no truth to that, but it's basically ridiculous and wrong, but I kind of bought into it. I said, this sounds like a good idea, so that solves my religion problem, right? So here I am with this meaningless symbol system, lost. I'm at Union Carbide. I'm living with my parents, and as I said, every now and again, I'm I'm wondering about these things. I throw up that kind of a prayer. Now, Ed Tuttle, the man who led me to Jesus, one day, and this is the power of Scripture, 
One day, he boldly gives me an index card on which he had written the scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11 to 13. Some of you know it. It's famous. I didn't know it at the time. I'd never read the Bible. And it says, "For I, this is the Lord speaking, for I know the plans I have toward you, says the Lord. Lord speaking. I know the plans I have toward you. Plans not to harm you, but plans to give you hope in the future. And I remember reading this and thinking, huh, if God is speaking here and he's saying, I know that I have plans for you not to harm you, Eric. Because I, wasn't that what I was afraid of? Isn't that what a lot of people are afraid of? That I'm going to become like those Jesus freaks. I'm going to become weird. I'm going to become like that person who is an embarrassment, always talking about Jesus, you know, on street corners. And, and I don't want to be like that person, and so I want to be sophisticated and accepted culturally. So I'm reading this, and it says, I know the plans I have toward you, says the Lord, plans not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Now, if you're sitting in that fluorescent cubicle quarter mile from the nearest window, the concept of hope and a future is a, is a pretty positive concept. That was really not on my horizon at that point. And I thought, wow, is this real? And how weird that God seems to understand that we might be afraid of him and that he would need to reassure us and say, no, no, you don't understand. I know the plans I have for you. Trust me, not to harm you, plans to bless you. And so this kind of worked on me a little bit, a little bit, because I didn't know, but it started to work on me. And long story short, one night I had a dream. Now, this is right around my 25th birthday. I'm about a year into this uh, baton death march living with my parents and in the dream uh i never had a dream like this before or since it was really a vision i don't know if you believe that the lord speaks through visions if you don't believe in that let me just say you're wrong uh the lord spoke to me in this vision in a dream and in the dream i'm standing actually let me let me tell you one thing which i forgot to tell you in my model of the Jungian, Freudian thing, whatever, I came up with an image that's, that sort of summed up what I thought was this idea of trying to find God. And I thought the, the conscious mind is kind of like the ice on a frozen lake, and the unconscious mind is the water beneath. And the unconscious mind, the collective unconscious, is all that water beneath that connects all of us with some magical energy force, kind of a new new age idea of God. And I thought, so maybe all religions are getting to is to drill through the ice to get to the water. That's kind of the goal somehow, and to have this kind of like psychic health, you know, soul health between the conscious mind and the unconscious, and that makes you an emotionally, spiritually healthy person. I, I get that. So that was kind of in my mind, right? Well, so one night I have this dream. In the dream, I'm standing on a frozen lake in Danbury, Connecticut. Canterwood Lake, biggest lake in Connecticut. And I'd been ice fishing there. And and so I'm standing there, and it's a brilliant, bright winter's day. You've had them where the sky is so blue, and, and, and the sun is so bright, and the ice and the snow are brilliantly white, And it's beautiful. And we're standing there ice fishing. And I look down, and there's a hole in the the surface of the ice. And I look into the hole, and there's a fish poking its nose out of the hole, like here I am. And I look down. Now, if you've ever ice fished, you know that does not happen. Uh, I think it might happen like in a Three Stooges short. Uh, where fish do stuff like that, or where they poke their noses out of the, you know, the fish chowder and spit at you. Uh, but in real life, if you're ice fishing, the fish don't do that. And in fact, you could fish all day long and you probably won't get a hit. But in this dream, I'm standing there and I see the fish poking its nose out. And I look at it and I reach down and I pick it up by the gill because it's a pickerel or a pike, a uh, large fish, uh, bronze colored, some of you know. But in the dream, as I'm holding this up, the sun is so bright and beautiful that it's shining on this bronze-colored fish, and it makes it look golden. And then in the dream, I realize it doesn't look golden. It is golden. It's like in a fairy tale. It is a golden fish made of gold but alive. And then suddenly in the dream, I realize the Lord just, boom, 
lets me have it. Eric, you wanted to drill through the ice to touch inert water, to touch this energy force thing. I have something better for you. I have ichthys, the golden fish. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, your Savior. This is true. This is what you're looking for. This is the answer to your search. And in the dream, all of this stuff comes together, and my mind is blown. I know the Lord has spoken to me and has one-upped me in the language of my own symbol system. He has condescended to speak to me in a way that would make no sense to anybody, but that speaks directly to me, that blows my mind in the dream, and I realize the Lord has revealed himself. He knows me infinitely more than I know myself. He has just given me something that combines, you know, the Greek word, my fishing background, and this dopey undergraduate symbol system with the Freudian stuff, and says, boom, boom. This is who you are. This is what you're looking for. In the dream, I knew this, and I'm holding the golden fish in the dream, and I'm flooded with joy. I know Jesus is real. I know that I have him. He has come from the other side to where we are. And what happens when a fish comes out of water? They come out of water, and they die. He came from the other side to us, to die so that we could go back with him to where we belong with him in eternity. All this comes to me in the dream and I know the Lord is alive, the Lord is real and he has given this to me to show me that he knows me and to show show me that he loves me enough that he would speak to me in a way that is so specific that it would completely blow my mind and change my life forever. And I woke up the next day and I told my friend at the, at the Union Car what happened. And he goes, well, what does that mean, Eric? And I said something I never would have said ever. I said, it means I have accepted Jesus. And my life changed utterly and dramatically from that moment forward. And the punchline, folks, for you is the Lord knows you exactly that way. He knows every one of us that way. And he wants you to know that he knows you like that. And he wants you to share that with anybody that doesn't know that, that the Lord knows you intimately. The Lord knows your fears. The Lord knows your sins. The Lord loves you. And the Lord wants to speak to you because you're his child. He knows exactly how to talk to you. And he wants to have that relationship with you and walk with you. Folks, when that happened to me, I just knew it's game over. Whatever I thought I was looking for, whatever I thought, I knew Jesus is real. And there is no question that there's nothing more to say. I have found the meaning of life. I was told life had no meaning. I was told you couldn't know there was a God. The Lord proved himself to me in that. He's proved himself to me a hundred times since then. But that was when it began. And I tell you that story just so you understand. That's everybody's story. We're all looking for the Lord. He gave that to me for you and for your neighbors to say, I'm not selling anything you don't want. We all want this. We all long for this. There's not a soul on this planet who was not created by the Lord to long for that relationship with him. And all we need to do is convince them, yes, it's for you. It's not for those religious people. This is for you. And only in this can you be fulfilled. Otherwise, you will be walking and stumbling and floating through your life. Accept what God did for you and know that he did it for you, not just for those religious people. He did it for you. And I tell you that story, folks, because it's true, because it happened. He defeated death. When you know that, you will live differently. When you know that he defeated death and he came from the other side to die so that he could defeat death, so that you could be free and live an eternal life with him forever. If you know that, don't hope it's true. Know that it's true because it is true. When you know that, you will live differently. You will live without fear. You will be brave. You will push back when people challenge you because you have been freed by the one who is freedom and who is truth. Live that way to his glory until you see him face to face. God bless you. Thank you. Amen. And this... 
This is a perfect opportunity if you've come here to Sacred Heart or if you're online um, and you understand now that the I-X-Y-E, I-X-O-Y-E is Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior, the Ithkis, the fish. Jesus came to save sinners. That's the whole reason that he became a fish out of water so that he could come to us from heaven to earth 